Now, this morning, I want to share with you something. Now, let me tell you what I want to share, and then that way you know where I'm going, and then you know what I'm after. It's very difficult to minister to the lost, someone that is in the world, if you do not understand how they think about themselves and how they are within themselves. And I look at the way the world is and people that have no idea about God, about Jesus, or conviction, is that when you get to know them, you lose the idea or you do not move any anymore in the concept that they're really lost way down there when there's no way to retrieve them because they're so far away. And then I'm going to share with you how close we are from somehow looking like them. When you see in that perspective, you begin to have the fear of God within you, and you become conscious of bondage, you become conscious of spiritual growth, and you become conscious of the need of surrender, of repentance, of coming under conviction. Because you're not like them anymore, but you act like them now and then. And there are some coloration, some texture, some type of small pieces of residues that now and then <laughs> come forth out of your past. It causes you to be just like a lost, beaten, worn out person. In this idea of becoming holy, becoming righteous, becoming pure, becoming a man of God, a woman of God, is only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, you know, I, do, I know some of you have a problem with tongues, but you're going to get over it. Because if you do not really come to the terms of receiving the Holy Spirit in terms of changing you, you remain the same. You're always struggling with faith. What the Holy Spirit does is to, is to actually convict you in areas and move into areas and allow you to grow steadily faster and you begin to have fruits. Which is the most wonderful thing about being a Christian. Fruits. Without it, you're going to vegetate. It's a wonderful thing. And second, uh, by the way, when you are a spirit-filled Christian and developing... You actually win over battles that most people don't. And I'm talking about battles that are very serious. I mean, I'm talking about big time needs. And I don't want to fail on them. You know, I don't care about some of my uh, emotions and my, some of my problems in here and there. But when it comes to the big battles, oh, you got to win. You got to win. And so let's take a look at first of the mind of the lost. And in this series of I mentioned that bondage settles fast. And what I mean by it is, and I'm speaking now, breaking out from bondage. But bondage settles fast, meaning that we, we love to return to areas where we are enslaved by situations, by things, by persons, by objects, by, by events. We settle. Bondage settles very fast. And it's amazing how it does. In other words, Kentucky beat Georgia. Uh, that can eat you up for about a month. If you don't realize that really Georgia beat Kentucky for the last 25,000 years. <laughs> and you've got to be graceful to allow the state of Kentucky to have one Sunday where they don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> you understand bondage settles real fast in terms of personality, in terms of who you are. It's amazing how you don't like yourself, you don't like the way you feel about things, you don't like other people. You need to get rid of that because, see, bondage settles fast. It's like hot glue, crazy glue. It, you have to get away from it real quick. And then it says bondage retracts you to the old man. And I'm speaking now, I'm speaking about the saints now for just a moment, the Christians, us, say. It, it retracts you to the old man. And this, these retractions are normal. They're acceptable, but you must realize that they're occurring. That's all. There's no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. But every time you retract to the old man, you must come yourself to attention and says, I, I messed up in there. Lord, have, have mercy. That wasn't right. You've got to correct yourself. By the way, the only way to correct the subconscious, which is a part of you that you don't know is exists, is to talk to it. For more of that, you can talk to my brother here in the front pew because he's a doctor on it. How to be healed from your subconscious. It's not an easy thing to do. Most of our problems are retractions upon retractions that settled and are now piled up. And so when it piles up to where you don't deal with it in communion or on church or in spiritual life, you need deliverance. 
So take that for just a moment. Now, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new, uh, a new creation. The old has gone, the, the new has come. It is our motto. First, second Corinthians 5, 17. It is our motto. We need to come to that understanding that, that we are new creation. And I don't want to retract you to, to condemn you that you are somebody full of trouble. No, I'm just saying this. Bondage settles fast. And second, if it keeps on settling upon, upon that, upon that, upon that, upon that, before too long... You have a question of, of deliverance. You need the Holy Spirit to come and kick the H-E double hockey sticks of your soul. <laughs> and you must remember that in, within your mind. You know, it's very often that I come into a, a, my bathroom and I just come and be deliverance for myself. I begin telling God to set me free. Come Holy Spirit of God. I'm tired of this. I'm, I'm too involved with that. You know, I did that to buy, with barbecue ribs. <laughs> By the way, you know, uh, every city I went, barbecue ribs showed up. And my doctor said, it's full of triglycerides. It can kill you, Rick. I mean, it can kill you faster than anything else. It killed your father, and it can kill you. And so uh, I had a problem with uh, that. I, uh, the last time I did, I bought a whole back baby back ribs from uh, Arkansas, from the city of uh, Van Buren. And the name of the place is Rick's Barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> And I put it down, and I jumped on it, screamed on it, hollered, broke the whole thing, messed up the whole hotel. And then I paid the, the lady $20 to come to clean up, and they apologized about because it was a, an accident of faith. <laughs> and so, and so I, I finally came to terms with that. And I tell you, I can resist a baby back ribs anywhere in the world these days because I'm keeping it... I'm keeping under the eye of God saying this is going to hurt. It's going to kill me. Now, bondage is, is light as a feather. And this is a statement that I have uh, said it for many, many years. Because you think that all of this is so heavy. It's so stuck on you. That you think that perhaps you'll never be able to be set free. And I want you to know bondage is like a feather. It's very light. It's very, very light. You know, when Wayne, Wayne Baker, the fellow there in Moss Point, Mississippi, uh, he came up and he has to do with his anger. And his wife is retracted. She's, she's full of fear. And she's weeping there. And uh, you know that she's taken a lot of that. And, and so I just came to his head and I just I reprimand all this anger that you try to compare yourself to others that you try to measure yourself to others, therefore, because Jojo and Bob got the truck, you don't have the truck. You know, everybody's got to have a truck there. I mean, I didn't see a car in miles. I mean, all of them have to have a gun in the back rack, too. You know, I couldn't believe the parking lot of that church. Over 400 trucks. Everybody's got to have your truck. You're not a man until you got a truck. And so I've, uh, I knew that his truck was uh, beat up and old. And his dear friend. And so I began speaking to his pride. And began setting him free from trying to be a macho man. And trying to be in charge of his house. When the wife's supposed to. As far as the house goes. I want you to know. She's in charge. Forget it. Do whatever she tells you. Shut up. Amen. Really. That will save your marriage. In other words. If you're still trying to be the man of your house. You really. You get it. You, you got to get it together. She's in charge. All you do is to obey. <laughs> and so bondage is like a feather very light all you have to do is to simply just believe and, and allow someone that have faith to pray for you and it's gone suddenly very quickly it doesn't take too long to be set free you know that now I want to talk specifically now about the breakdown of bondage for the lost because all of us want to sort of get some glimpse of really what the Holy Spirit is after in uh, Romans uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 18 and 19, I think it says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and weakness of men who suppress the truth by their weakness. Meaning that they suppress the truth by what they do. Meaning they know the truth and they do it to suppress it. You think that the lost would do something because he's dumb and he loves to just be himself. No, he knows what's right, but he does it in order to... Simply suppress what he thinks is right. I thought that the lost are people who just have no idea or concept of God, which is erroneous. Let me get to this. Suppressing the truth is a choice. Let me read it again so you can get a little bit. It says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all godliness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their weakness. And so 
suppression is a choice. And all of you have choices. I'm not talking about heavy sins now. I'm talking about personality deficiencies that the Holy Spirit has never been able to deal with it because you simply have a choice to become and to be yourself. You see, you can't remain yourself within community and be victorious. The Holy Spirit will never move to the blessings of God because you like to be yourself. And then the uh, truth is plain and understood. Now, let me read this. It's uh, verse 19. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Now, when I thought about that, I thought, you're telling me that everybody out there in this world, from every square mile around this church, knows the truth that there is a God. Yes, they do. You tell me that actually there's some spirituality in them, even though they're hell raisers. They care less about it. They care less about the church. They care less about people. They're just locked up in there. Yes, they are. And by the way, most of them are damaged people because of life, especially from family environment. All of them are prospects for salvation because they're away from God. The farther, say with me, the farther you are away from God, the greater the possibility that you might be saved. Really. Because men, men and human beings are not happy when they're away from God. They, they really are looking for a way out to come closer. And as you know, our church is a church that reaches out to the lost, the broken, the, the people that need help, people that uh, need the Lord, just like me. The truth is plain, understood. They know it. Third, God has made the truth plain to them. Now, how does God make the truth plain? Well, Paul speaks about since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality, his eternal power and divine nature. In other words, it's impossible for human beings not to be convicted of the eternal power of God in his divine nature. It's amazing. Dr. Bob Tuttle, when he came to preach to us here some time ago, mentioned about a story that he took his truck or his bu- a rental taxi into Manchuria. And he came to the edge of Manchuria, and then he simply put all the gas he could to go and come back and use the first tank to go. And then when the tank ran out, he looked up to the southern China in, in those bare mountains. There's no woods anymore, just bare mountain rocks. And a white smoke came out from behind one of those mountains. And he ran over there and, uh, and found a lady dressed up in a carpet type of thing, heavy, and face was corroded by the, the weather and the wind and, and the cold. And he offered him a little bowl of soup, which ended up to be dog soup. Uh, and it was very, very tasty, he said. And then uh, the translator and the taxi driver began to tell uh, this woman about uh, God. And, and, and she mentioned the word Jesus. And so when she heard Jesus, and Bob Taylor said, Jesus, Jesus. And he said, that's his name. I've been crying out for his name. And right off she turned up and went, Oh, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Meaning for the first time she realized the name of that person that she hungered for. Every human being in the city of Athens hungers for Jesus. You know, Billy Graham just preached his last, his last greatest, most powerful meeting at a stadium in New Orleans this last week. And at the end of the meeting, he simply just opened the doors of the stadium and said to everybody, I'm going to get on that golf cart, and we're, we're going to go to the French quarters. And we're going to meet the French quarters, and I want you to go with me because this is something I've never done. I've been here locked up in community for so long, and he just took everybody out into the world. And he said, every person in the French quarter of New Orleans is open to the Word of God. All you have to do is to just come to them, introduce yourself, and they'll begin responding to you. And so I want you to get the idea in your mind that evangelism is the easiest form of ministry there is if you simply believe that God has given you power in order to reach the lost. And I'm speaking about the mind of the saint. Now, in dealing with them as to who they are, there are three evolutionary means following procedures. Now, every person that is lost, they become lost by a series of activities that Paul says it follows into evolutionary procedure that begins with idolatry. And then the, the worship of self and then the deprived mind. And Paul is very specific on ch- chapter 1 about this. 
because he's introducing the concept of righteousness and he introduces the idea of the lost as being three. Now, idolatry, for although they knew God, they neither glorify him as God nor gave him thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Meaning, they cannot recognize God as the one who rules and reigns above the circle of the earth. They have this idea that God is not there. They begin idolizing something else. Now, the second is the worship self, which is the next procedure, meaning God turns you over as God allows you to go into another step. And here's the, the second thing the lost becomes. They exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. I mean, they begin to worship self. Very easy for you to like yourself so much that you're so enthralled with yourself. You think that yourself is just uh, needs attention. And you find most of our society idolizing the person, the personality. You become involved with self to a point to where you simply are on the throne. And then the third thing is, and I'm thinking about three words that are idolatry, worship self, and the deprived mind. And then Paul says that God turns them over again into something like this. Now, when I look at this, something happened to me because I begin finding out myself in that. A lot of us Christians have these things within us. We actually, actually participate in them. But let's take a look. It says, they become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil, disobey your parents, senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such a thing deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, notice that idolatry produces worship of self, and then worship of self is the private mind. Now, I'm not saying to you, and I, want, I don't want you to get this and, and make any value of it, but I want you to know that your battle is really to rise from some of these things that you now and then act upon and convict yourself that you can remain on them too long because you're not this way anymore. The old man has gone, you, the new creature. You are a Christian, an anointed person. Now, say with me. When I am conscious and convicted of what I have done in terms of my personality, in terms of my behavior, that is my gift. You must take it real fast. Now, don't play games with this because, you see... If you play, well, this is not right, you know, I, I really wasn't, uh, you know, honestly, faithless. I have been faithless. And every time I doubt the God's provision, I simply get real mad, you know. When I doubt God's provision, I open the door of my car, there's a hole in the roof, and I just put my hand out, begin screaming and kicking every bit of every demon I know out of my car. I don't want to be faithless. I don't want to be in a stage where I'm doubting the hand of God. Sometimes, I, I, I don't know if I've ever been uh, heartless. I'm pretty much a chicken. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I have a good heart. But uh, yeah, gossip, malice, mm -mm. a little bit of uh, strife, yeah. Not murder. Well, sometimes. <laughs> you know, God, I like to... Uh, <laughs> Envy. But I must be conscious because this is a state of myself and I used to be this way and I'm not. So let's confess. Say, say God, I need to know when I have crossed the line and I must act in repentance at that very second or else it becomes bondage and it settles real fast. I want you to think about this. Because, you see, as you live in community, as you come to church and you become members of a church, we say a lot of things, we do a lot of things that, that we don't apologize for it. And what makes the Holy Spirit bring people into a community is your heart and forgiveness toward each other. You cannot, in this environment, have anything against each other. You must confess it. You must approach them. You must say it. And there's a lot of love. You can say it. You don't have to be harsh, you don't have to be rude, but you just simply say, you know, Rick, you know, sometimes I, you bother the worst out of me. 
I guess it's because of you being a foreigner. I just, you know, don't like foreigners much. And I, I want you to know every time I look at you, I want to squeeze your neck because you're so good looking. <laughs> you understand? Tell nicely. Call, you understand? You do it to, to each other. I cannot go to bed until I say, honey, would you please forgive me? I made an ass of myself. And I tell him. I really do. So, honey, would you, would you please forgive me? I, I really was out of line. And Mary Lucy has a forgiving heart. And she just hugs me and kisses me. And life goes on. Amen? Now, and this is the breakdown uh, of bondage for the saved. This is how Paul looks at uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And the first thing he says is an attitude of humility. If you read the chapter as a whole, you're going to come to that understanding. He says, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness? Or tolerance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. Meaning that the kindness of God, the love of God is so overwhelming toward you and I, but we don't want to realize it's there. As if somehow he will do it and we deal with it when it comes time. You see, it's impossible for you to take communion, come into the presence of God in forgiveness, if your heart is just so hard. As if you don't want to, you're so insensitive to your personal spiritual needs. You understand? We become sort of insensitive, like it, it's not happening. Things will go down in the wash. It doesn't go down in the wash. The Holy Spirit looks at it and he begins to pause and begins to ponder. My God, I, there's no conviction in you. There's no softness in your heart. There's no tenderness. You don't realize the, the kindness of God. You seem to sort of a see spiritual life as if God did it, and so it's done, and so let it be. But you can't live in bondage too long until you look at it. And you say, I, I tell you, God, um, this week was a bad week. I remember this and this and that, and I, I want to bring it to your attention, and I want to ask you to bless me because I don't like what I see. Now, when you begin to do that in your spiritual life, the Holy Spirit just, oh, oh God. I mean, it's just awful fast. You can see conviction begin to come place. And so, an attitude of humility is not an easy thing to have. Not really. An attitude of humility is very embarrassing to ask God forgiveness for the same sin constantly. As you know, in the New Testament, the word hamartia means missing the mark in his majority of sins in the New Testament. You're going to have to continuously, simply keep on bringing that to him, even if you miss it. But keep on bringing it. God, I just ask you, I still got the same problem. Lord, I'm still missing the mark here. Would you please forgive me? You understand? You bring into remembrance of the Holy Spirit your need. Don't sit there and say, I love you, God. No, this. Uh, when you take communion, you say, God, I ask in the name of Jesus, I'm, I'm still uh, you headed about certain things. I'm still tough about certain things. And I, I, I'm easy to anger. I'm easy to say something against my brother. Lord, would you forgive me my mouth? I can't stand it. Now, second attitude of, of, uh, of simply being humble. And now the third is, realize his kindness and tolerance to others. And do not have an unrepented heart. And of course, this is the scripture. When you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you escape God's judgment? Now, Paul is simply saying that as you look at the lost and you become a person that confront the lost by passing judgment on how bad they are, Paul says, you do the same things. And so in order to sort of uh, bring you into grace, you must realize that you must come into conviction. You must come into repentance. And then you begin to love the lost. So say with me for just a moment, would you? Say, the reason why I cannot approach anyone to witness is because my concept of them being lost is so overwhelming that I don't communicate with their lostness. They're aliens, and I'm the one who knows Jesus. There are people way out there in the world they know nothing about, and I know the truth. And Paul says, don't you pass judgment on them because you do the same things. Now, you are under the grace of God, under his righteousness, but they're not. But you must realize that. 
Let's take a look to the next verse, uh, which is uh, Romans chapter 2. It says, to those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he'll give eternal life. It's a question of persistence. You must be persistent. Now, by the way, the Holy Spirit in you is ready to fish when you recognize these concepts that I'm sharing with you this morning. The Holy Spirit is ready to fish, to get souls, when you realize that the lost is not as lost as you think, that they don't know what they don't know, they do know, in that you are someone covered by grace, and you should not ever place judgment on them, and by being open to their lostness, you might be able to save some. But to those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Yes, yes. And that goes for both ways. Now, say bondage crumbles under persistence. Nothing in spiritual life remains until you persist. That is why I've been telling you, when you come to the altar to pray, usually you, you look down. Methodists have this thing. Baptists usually don't. Pentecostals, they stand up. It's a funny thing. Presbyterians, they sit on the pew. <laughs> but I'm telling you this. Uh, they arrive. You know, First Presbyterian Church of Savannah, Georgia, they sit but man, I'm telling you, they weep. It's not where you are, really. It's what you do with what you got. And so as you come before God, it's an insistence must come from within your heart. It's not something you drum up. It's not emotional. You simply say, God, I just want to tell you, Lord, I, oh, hello, God, have mercy. You understand? Some of us must be expressive. Why? Because we're passive. We have in ourselves the idea that if we are any louder than anybody else, we're going to really upset the band. And it's wrong. In other words, the Holy Spirit is out there asking you to come before God and say to the Lord what you need to say. God, I just ask you to bless me. Come, Holy Spirit of God. Meaning, to those of you that are passive, you must come forth. To those of you that are overwhelmingly opened up to everything that God, extrovert ones, you okay. You understand? It's a question of the heart. And so bondage crumbles under persistence. Really. Of all the things that I have been against me in the last few years, and by the way, you know, as you get older, you know, hell break loose against you. All kinds of things. I mean, I had more people to accuse me of things I wasn't accused of, I wasn't guilty of, and horrible things said about me. And so, I mean, you go crazy if you count them. And I have decided that really I must overcome anything that, lo- that takes my joy. Say it. I must overcome anything that takes my joy. I met a, a young lady that came to the altar. And when I began to pray for her, uh, the word rape came into mind. And so I told her that that incident needed to be dealt with. She began to cry a lot because it reveals something very personal. And I told her this, unless you deal with this incident in your life, you will never be able to grow spiritually because you simply need healing in this area. And you have gone over so fast that God is not blessing you in the areas you need to be blessed. Not that the Holy Spirit don't want to bless you. It's because you have hurts in you that have not been dealt with. And in our congregation, perhaps this morning, there are hurts within you that have never been dealt with. You want to sort of put it down and you want to put it under the rug and you want to sort of forget about it. But if, if you're still suffering from it, it must be dealt with. I don't think you have to overpray over an incident 50 times. And you don't, but you must come to a place in which you say to yourself, God, I'm persisting into this matter of not having joy. Do you know that in every congregation, at least 30% of the people don't have any joy? They don't have any peace. No joy. I mean, I'm talking about having a good time. They're serious. They're taking medicine to go to sleep. They don't have any joy. And I can't believe that under tremendous grace and a tremendous outpouring of God upon the world today, you know, <laughs> you might think of yourself as being a small community. I want you to know you are part of the biggest thing that God is doing on earth. And, and the biggest, South America is coming to Jesus in the millions. Europe is coming in the millions. China, my Lord Jesus Almighty. Uh, where, Africa? My God, we're going to have more bishops from Africa in the next 10 years than in the United States all put together. In other words, when it comes to general conference, you're going to have a bunch of African bishops out there just pouring the Holy Spirit on the head of those liberals. God is moving. 
and you are part of the move of God in the earth. Oh, Rick, but, uh, you know, I'm very uncomfortable about this and about that. You know, I, I, I hate when he does this, you know. I, you know. The world is booging. Oh, Rick, I'm, I've up. Uh, I don't feel like I'm a part of it, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm really comfortable uh, with Athens in their very... I'm not saying the name of the church, but I went to a church in Athens, Georgia, about uh, 10 years ago, where the opening hymn was the Requiem. Folks, let me say this to you. God have mercy on us if we don't rise up from this death. I'm tired of that organ playing the same old thing for 50 years and nobody changing, nobody moving forward, nobody repenting of anything. You know, it's the same thing. Take an offering and let's just get the budget going. Let's pay the bills. And every time I see that preacher with that little belly going this way, I get real nervous. You understand? Real nervous because we become a group of people that are more idolatry than anybody else. You see, you are persisting upon a holy move of God in your life at Gateway because in this place there's freedom to persist. And I don't understand those of you that are visitors why you go to another dead Methodist church. I cannot make up my mind for that. Oh, God meets me there. If you're dying there, why are you going there? I mean, I tell this everywhere. You know, if I go to an area and I find a church that is alive, and I have visitation from all the other Methodists, I say, why in the world do you continue to go? Because that's where my mother and my dad were buried. Well, get over your mama and daddy's death. Come to God. Find a hole where the water is sweet. Oh, but I just love to be there because I made many friends. I want to be where the presence of God is, and I want to persist in being there. And I care less. Why? Why, Rick? Why do you say that? It's because I don't want nothing to settle over and over and over and over where I need deliverance about everything else. God, I have enough problems as it is. I want to be a free Christian, have a good time, with or die happy. You know, I, I want to be in that, uh, in that coffin just, thank you. I want to tell the man, I want to smile, you better make it, create it, push muscles. Now, Self-seeking will bring wrath and destroy relationships and quench the Holy Spirit. What do you mean by self-seeking? Paul speaks of that uh, into this chapter. Um, uh, chapter 2, he says, But to those who by persistent in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he'll give you eternal. But to those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there'll be wrath and anger. And I don't want to be self-seeking. One of the greatest fears I have is to please myself. Because then I become accustomed to something that is just foreign to me. I want the Lord to convict me. But I want to be reminded. I want to tell myself, I have done this wrong. I've been going the wrong way about this. You know, have a week, have a time with the Lord on, on Monday morning. Look the week before and take a look and see what you've done. Say, I, I, this is not right. I, I don't think that was proper. And Lord, don't let me do this and that and that and that. And before too long, you begin to move. Break and not produce his glory. And what I meant by is that, but glory, honor, and peace in, for everyone who does good, first the Jew and then the Gentile. Glory, honor, and peace is the beginning of a fulfilled life. What is glory? Glory is just a feeling that God is over and in charge and you have considered. That's all. That brings glory. A lady went to Brazil this last trip and she wanted to know, Rick, I came to see the glory of God. And I said, well, I tell you, it's going to be hard to find because it's with you. I said, what do you mean? So you bring the glory. And so we went to a church where all the drummers, all the musicians were barefooted looking to a wall where there's a face of a lion, the lion of Judah. And they wouldn't look at us. They're all the, but they were rocking. I mean, they were playing. Those guitars were hot. And just for an, one song took an hour. And then I noticed that all the children are jumping up front and everybody is jumping in blessing, and the preacher, young man, <laughs> came out, and which you know, this surprised me. He said, I bring you the anointing of the lion. And I said, Wait a minute, who is the lion? Where is he? Is he something biblical? And then I remember that uh, in, in Revelations, there are four creatures under before the throne the lion, the eagle, the man, 
is the deer. And he began putting the honor of the Lord upon those people. Come and repent and receive the honor of the Lord. And my goodness gracious, half of the congregation moved forward and began to roar like a lion, repenting of their sins. And these are poor people of the most impoverished area I've ever seen. These are grown up adults, young men, women, old men, elders, just kneeling down and asking God for forgiveness. I said, wait a minute now, this is a little bit uh, a little out of order here. And, I, I, and as the service progressed, and I, I, my group is just jumping and hollering there because... The next thing he did was the anointing of the calf. That's what it is, the calf. <laughs> and so the whole group is just, a, oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, God, set me free. And that lady is just jumping herself silly. And I thought, you know, this is not going to fit in our Methodist church when I get home. I need to find a way to explain this to them and just come to order here. And then the lady came to me and said, Rick, I believe I found the glory of God. He said, what do you mean? He said, the glory of God is when I consider myself before God without shame. Say it. The glory of God is when I consider myself before God without shame. That is glory. You see, we're so self-aware of each other that we can't be ourselves because we don't know how. And the Holy Spirit is saying, if you can't be happy with yourself and happy in community and come before me like children, by no means we'll enter it. And in that particular moment, when I looked to the whole thing, I said, God, this is glory. And that was that lady from Kentucky sitting here and saying, Oh, God, forgive my sin. Oh, God, forgive my sin. Oh, God. I said, Ma'am, you're a saint. I don't think you have a sin that I know of. You're just full of glory. He said, Rick, I'm tired of looking at my soul as if it is parked somewhere in a parking lot and is dealt with once a year during Christmas. I want every single moment of my life to give the Holy Spirit a window within my soul to deal with my trash, for I am a new creature, but I must take care of it. Say, glory must come within me, within who I am. And the glory of God is only present. You finish. When I'm without shame. Romans 12, 2, 11 says, For God does not show favoritism. I mean, he's not going to please anybody. It's up to you and I to come to this place to where anything that is holding back comes to his presence. And so this morning, we're going to have a time of intercession in the altar. And I want to invite specifically those of you that say, Rick, I want to break through. You see, I'm so self-conscious of myself uh, that... uh, I don't have the freedom. And I'm full of condemnation. I'm condemned. You know, what happened to me in the past was so traumatic that I can't get out of it. And you must. You must come out of it. How long is it going to be for you to be there wailing and mourning? You come and wail and mourn before the presence of God. You know, Joel chapter 2. Come and, and, and rend your heart, I said you last night. And as you become then in His presence, these bondage begin to break. And God set you free in a moment of shape. Amen. Now let's just have a confession before the Lord before we pray. Let's say, why don't you repeat after me? Say, I am a very well educated, blessed person. But my mode of being, the way I have conducted myself in society, in the presence of others, does in no way justify the way, I need, the way I need to conduct myself in the presence of God. These are two battlegrounds that are totally separate. When I'm in the presence of God, I must become like a child. Gentle, sweet, tender. Allowing the Holy Spirit to sift within my soul. For anything that robs my peace, my joy, the fellowship of God that I have within me. In this morning... I ask you, Lord, that I become that person. 